Now, if you have your Bibles open, please, uh, at Psalm number 42. Psalm number 42. And this is the second in just a couple of messages on Psalm 42. And uh, I think the title that was given to these is Resisting the Black Dog, um, for want of a better title. Um, but, but what is it about? Well, it's about the struggles. It's about the struggles of a, a man of God and struggles within himself, struggles to make sense of some of the things that are, are, are going on around him and, to, and happening to him. Uh, and some of, his, some of his feelings and some of his despondency and his discouragement uh, and his disquiet and his depression uh, here and in lots of other places. So um, we'll have a look into it just for a, a few moments today. Now, if you've driven around the countryside, you don't have to go very far in Western Australia before you come across somewhere, in perhaps in a paddock near the roadside, a dead gum tree that has been painted a particular shade of blue. And uh, they're dotted around all over the place, and even if you go on country roads. And I wonder if you know the idea of those trees. The idea of those trees is that they are to draw your attention to mental health, and uh, they're to draw your attention to the work particularly of an organization called Beyond Blue. Uh, the idea being that uh, not so much now, but not so long ago, we would talk about feeling blue if you were feeling down and if you were feeling discouraged or depressed. Someone might describe it as feeling blue. Well, they want to raise awareness about what it feels like when you go beyond feeling blue. And so there it is, a, a dead, dry, sapless tree, almost like a skeleton, but it's still standing. And I suppose it's representative of how people might feel and how you might have felt like that at times in your own life. You might have felt like a dead, a dead, dry tree somewhat. And the sap no longer flowing, and, but you're still standing. I'm sure there are people that feel like that. And I'm sure, in a measure, that's, why this, that's how this man felt as he writes this psalm. We don't know exactly that it is a psalm of David, but it may well be. There are certainly other psalms of David where he writes uh, very, similar, uh, very similar struggles and very similar things. And so he's, he's writing this. And um, what we said last time, we spent quite a long time on just thinking about the condition. And what we want to think about is some sort of structure for the message of this psalm is we could think like this. There's words here about the condition itself. We've said a bit about that already. And then there's a word here about the possible causes of the condition. And then something is said about, at least on a spiritual level, what we might call the curatives for the condition. We can't say that uh, the Bible is... is or a preacher is going to stand up here and say that he has got the cure for my particular mental anguish and struggles at a particular time. But there are certainly things here that our attention is drawn to which are, are curative, and he found them so, and so they're helpful for us. Now, um, just a word, about, just to remind you about the condition itself, he drew our attention to three things. First of all, it's a Christian condition. And don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Don't let anybody tell you that Christians don't get discouraged and Christians don't doubt and Christians don't get depressed because they do. Even though they might be very reluctant to acknowledge it and admit it, even though it might be that the general Christian public tend to think it's inconsistent with being a Christian to feel down, to feel discouraged, to be depressed, 
This man was a lover of God. This man was the Old Testament equivalent of a Christian. No one says honestly that he pants for God like a deer pants for water, that he longs for God, that he got so much help and blessing and encouragement out of worshipping and fellowshipping with the people of God. Nobody says that unless the grace of God is working in them and they are one of God's people. And so he is, he is a believer, this man, and yet he finds himself in this condition and he's very honest about it. And so we would say that it's a Christian condition. Not every Christian, but many Christians. And you may remember how last time we went back into history and we, we sprinkled the message with a few examples of great men, wonderful Christian men, preachers, hymn writers, heroes of the Bible, all of them, many of them, who have struggled with exactly this kind of situation. And yet they knew and they loved and they were blessed and they were used beyond measure, some of them, by God. And yet their struggles were deep and dark and great. So it's a Christian condition. Um, secondly, we may say under this first idea that it's common. It's much more common than you might think. And it's much more common than we might be made aware of. And it's, it's, it's much more common than we're aware of because we're reluctant to speak about it. When we do struggle with it, when it happens to us, we're not always good at being transparent about it because we're not sure just how spiritual or unspiritual it is or it sounds. But believe me, it's common. It's a lot more common than you may think. And you and I and others who are here today may have had these very same struggles. You may be having them today uh, and identify with this man. So it's a common condition. And then we may also say it's a cursed condition. It's a cursed condition. It's a curse. It's not the curse, but it's a product of the curse. And it's a cursed thing. It's a thing Spurgeon, Spurgeon, long before Winston Churchill used the words, Spurgeon used to refer to it as the black dog and Winston Churchill called it the black dog and perhaps that's a, perhaps that's a, a useful metaphor. I don't know, but, but it's, it's a cursed thing. It's stubborn. It's difficult. It can be recurring. And for all those reasons, it's, it's not pleasant. And I would say it's a cursed thing. But let's, let's take a little more time to think about the causes. What might be the causes of this condition from a, a Christian and a biblical standpoint? Well, the first thing we must say is that the causes, among the causes, First of all, we must say, is the fall of man. Or let me put it like this, sin. Not your sin, not my sin, but sin. The fall of man into sin. Do you know what that means? That means that you were born broken. And I was born broken. And I was born sinful. And I was born... Um, out of sync and out of harmony with God. And I was born, if you like, with ill health wired into me. That's the result of the fall of man. Diseases and all sorts of conditions. All of these things that came as a result of the fall of man. But I would say this also. You must not look beyond... God as a cause. Now, why would I say that? Well, I would say that particularly because uh, in, a, in a Christian sense, we believe in the sovereignty of God. We believe in the sovereignty of God with all our hearts 
and we believe he's sovereign over everything, over every aspect of life, over every aspect of my life. He's sovereign over my conditions. He's sovereign over my health, over my constitution, if you like. His, in his sovereignty, I was born to be the way I am. The way I am, if you like, constitutionally, physiologically, genetically, if you like. But then there's another thing that's going on here because we also know that God's in the business of sanctifying his people. And God's not beyond using all sorts of difficulties and trials and troubles in our life for the purpose of sanctifying us, for the purpose of refining us, for the purpose of getting, to us, uh, uh, to, uh, getting us to a point where he says he will bring us forth like gold, like we've been through the refiner's fire, like the dross of sin has been addressed and burned up not perfectly, but he is in the business of sanctifying us. And he will use all sorts of things, all sorts of things, to glorify his son and to make us glorify his son and to shine brightly for his son. This man, if it is David, this man prayed like this once. God, he said, it was good for me to be afflicted. Before I was afflicted, you know what? Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now, now I keep your word. Is that what it takes? Is that what it's going to take for, for me to make me keep the word? If that's what it takes, it's not beyond God. It's not beyond God making sure. So there's this, this is a really helpful psalm, if you like, for filling out a good, robust doctrine of sanctification. That God is behind these things, and he says that. He believes it. And it may sound shocking to some ears, but it shouldn't, and it's not. He says, oh my God, my soul is cast down. And, and then he says, uh, all your waves and your billows have gone over me. And then he plucks up courage and he goes as far as this. I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? This is your doing, God. You're in this. Why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of my enemies? So um, we must do justice to the sovereignty of God and God's work of sanctification. But then there's another thing going on here, isn't there? And that's spiritual warfare. And that's the devil. And so between these things, between the fall and sin, my sin, the sovereignty of God, the sanctifying work of God, and the attacks of the devil, all of these things are part and parcel of what I will be called upon in my Christian life to believe and address and to cope with and to consider. And he says that. He knows he's in a spiritual warfare. Uh, he, he says about the people that are mocking him and saying, where is your God? Uh, he says that they're his enemies, that he feels like they're breaking his bones. They say to me uh, all day long, where is your God? He remembers. He remembers better times. He had better times. Have you had better times as a Christian than the times that you now have? Apparently he does. He has had better times than what he's experiencing at the moment. He remembers them. He says, I pour out my soul within me. I used to go with the multitude up to the house of God. I went with them with a voice of joy and praise, with a multitude that kept a pilgrim feast, but not now. Not now, he says. That's a memory. That was the past, but it's not the present. I don't feel that. I don't have access to that now. That access to that has been withdrawn. That door's been closed for whatever reason. 
Matthew Henry has a wonderful comment uh, on this in his commentary. He says this. He says, sometimes God teaches us effectually to know the worth of his blessings by withdrawing them for a time and making us want them. I think that's what the psalmist is thinking. Perhaps that explains things. I know it explains things in my life and has at times. And perhaps it explains things in your life. Well, what would we say about a curatives? Curatives for this condition. Well, first of all, you would need to think along two lines. Providential and theological. First of all, it would be the wisest and most sensible thing to you to do, to use every God-given means given by his providence to seek treatment for your condition. I mean medical treatment. This is the providence of God. God has providentially worked and provided. And it's not spiritual, it's not super spiritual, and it's not sort of super Christian to try and say you don't need that and I'll go without that that's, that's a, a, a folly the right idea would be to use whatever God given means might be at your disposal whatever has been given providentially by God in common grace you use it why if you were a diabetic you wouldn't have a problem about seeking treatment and getting treatment medically for it. But when it comes to our mental health, it seems to be a big step, a big step, a roadblock almost. But don't let that be so, because God is a God of good, kind providence and common grace. But then you need to think theologically, especially if you're a believer. And you say, what is the curative? Well, the curative is, of course, Christ. Christ. A knowledge of Christ. A knowledge of Christ. And that, sadly, is what is missing so often. And if you haven't got a good knowledge of Christ then you're at the mercy of all sorts of thoughts and ideas and discouragements and attacks. Christ. You, you have the benefit of being part of a fellowship where you can wake up on Sunday mornings and confidently come here and expect to have good teaching, good teaching, good preaching. Expect to hear the Bible handled properly and Christ to be promoted and explained and the gospel to be preached. Do you know how valuable that is? Do you know how rare that is in the modern day, in the Christian world, in the Christian culture? It's not as common as you think it is. It's a wonderful thing to have good teaching because it's good teaching that is going to carry you through things like this. It's good theology that is going to carry you through things like this and is going to carry you through death. And only good theology, you see. And good theology centres on Christ. Now think like this. If you could talk to this man, this is what you'd say to him. You see, he doesn't understand what you understand. And Christ hasn't come and died and risen again and the Bible hasn't, the canon of scripture hasn't been completed. But that's not your case. Christ has come and you have the full revelation of, the full revelation of God about Jesus Christ. And, and your knowledge of Christ needs to think about things like this. Your possession of Christ. Now, that's not, that's not a blasphemous idea at all. 
Christ has given himself for you. He has given himself to you. Christ in me, the hope of glory. Your possession of Christ. Now, think of it. If that's true, if it's true that I possess the Son of God, I, I say it reverently and, and correctly in a scriptural sense. If I possess the Son of God, if I have the Son of God living with, within me, the Son of God who has pledged to never leave me and never forsake me, what a difference that must make. Oh, it's not going to make, it's not going to make everything rosy. But it's going to make all these, all these deadly conditions, it's going to make them terminal. Momentary light afflictions. Paul describes them. And there's going to be an end. And there's going to be a beginning. A wonderful new beginning, you see. Possession of Christ. Make sure you possess Christ. Make sure you know him. That he's yours, that you can say with an honest, clear and good heart, Christ is mine. Can you say that today? Christ is mine. But then take the next step. And what would you say then? Well, you say this. Christ possesses me. What a thought. What a thought. That I have been purchased. Purchased. I am owned. I've been paid for. Lock, stock and barrel. I've been purchased and I now belong to Jesus Christ. I belong to God. I am one of his if I am a Christian. He possesses me. What a wonderful thought. What a glorious thought. What have I to fear? What have I to, what have I to care? Let me see and let me think and let me look towards eternity. Oh, and then you think of all the promises that are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. You think of how, how the relationship has been sealed with a covenant made by God and sealed with the blood of his son, written as it were, a promise to save you, written as it were in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then his pledge to preserve and to bless and to keep you. Let me put it like this. There are several things that can never be taken from you if you're a believer. They can never be taken from you. And they are these. The Word and the Spirit and the Son and the salvation of God. Come what may, those things can never be taken from you. Well, draw your, get your perspective, draw, get your bearings from that kind of position and it will be a help, a help to us. One of the old writers said that we should, we should read our favourite verses in the word of God like this. We should imagine that the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking directly to us and he takes our hand in his hand and he presses it against his breast and says to us, can you not feel the throbbing heart of my love for you? William, William Bridge said that. He said it when he looked at Ephesians 4 and verse 13, I think it was. And he said that's how we should look at the word of God and the promises of God. What a wonderful and glorious idea. Personal. It's all personal. It's got to be personal. And it is personal. Well, may God encourage you, and if you're going through 
uh, a dark night of the soul and the spirit, then may God lift that and give you light. And if you're not a Christian and you're going through that situation, then the first thing you must do is come to Christ. Come to Christ. I'm not suggesting this will be an instant cure, but it will certainly make a huge difference. Come to Christ. Receive what is Christ, a reversal of the curse is found only in Jesus Christ. So shall we pray for a moment? Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you so much. You tell us that we should guard how we think. You tell us that we should bring thoughts into captivity to the Lord Jesus Christ. And sometimes our minds run away with us and we get dark and foreboding thoughts. Help us, Lord, to know how to bring our thoughts into captivity to Christ. Fill us with a fresh assurance of all that is ours because of him and through him and can never be, uh, can never be taken away, can never be lost. Heavenly Father, you tell us in your word that we should be transformed by the renewing of our mind. So please do that for us. For any here today that are downcast, discouraged, depressed, having a struggle in the realm of their mind, their emotions and their psyche, Lord, please look upon us and be gracious to us. Have mercy upon us and uh, give us that allevi alleviating grace in the, in the place of our minds and emotions and hearts and thoughts and help us to see the Lord Jesus Christ clearly and his love, help us to feel it, help us to have an experiential uh, experience uh, of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and the love you have for us in him. So thank you, Lord, in his name. Amen.